Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Kreitas. Today is March 5th, 2019. Thanks for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everyone is doing well. And before I kick off with the news of the day, I want to wish my yaya, my grandmother, a very happy birthday. Love you, yaya. Many more. We'll see you soon when you get back from sunny Florida. Can't wait to see you. So the market news today. S&P was down three points. Dow was down 13. NASDAQ was down one, and the Russell 2000, the small cap index, was down seven points. So what's going on here? we got a couple back-to-back down days. Now, this one was a lot more muted than yesterday, but what's taking place? Has the discussion, has the numer, are, there, are the rumors losing steam with U.S.-China trade talks? Where's the beef? We want some facts. We're tired of having our hand held through this whole process. Yes, we rallied. Yes, we got the Federal Reserve Chairman Powell put under the market to keep this thing up, propped up. We got all the breadcrumbs of the trade talks. We're basically back to where we were before the 20% correction in the fourth quarter of 2018. What's going on? Isn't everything fine? Isn't everything rosy? Isn't everything dandy? Why are these markets going down? Don't they know that this is the best economy ever? They should never pull back. So where's the disconnect? Is it finally coming true? Look, I tell you all the time, I'm not crazy enough or smart enough, I don't know, whatever, however you want to describe it, to day trade these markets and to pretend to know what's going to happen tomorrow. I would have more confidence in my forecasts and predictions if this was a real market, but it's not. That's evident. There's too much funny money floating around everywhere from central banks the world over. There's too much fiscal stimulus from governments the world over. There's too many people giving press conferences and tweeting what they think should happen or what they want to happen and then sometimes miraculously it does happen so I can't tell you what's going to happen if this was a real market I would be more inclined to say that you know I'm surprised we're only down three points on the S&P 13 points on the Dow I would think that this would be the start of something bigger a bigger reversal because where's the catalyst for further upside gains Unless you just want to say that the money printing is enough and that the fiscal stimulus is enough. Well, if it is, then it shouldn't have stopped. It shouldn't have stuttered out yesterday, and it definitely shouldn't have stuttered and stalled further today. Because, again, I do these podcasts later in the evening, and the Japanese markets are open, and they're down so far, over 100 points. Of course, that's early in the day. That could swing trade. That could that could reverse. That's anything, because there are a bunch of lunatics over there, too, printing all their money like it's going out of style, maybe because it is going out of style. So I don't know what to tell you as far as predictions are concerned and what's going to happen on day to day. But this is just more evidence to me on my longer term outlook that this game is not going to end well and it is going to be coming to an end sooner rather than later, despite all of the efforts from central banks and governments the world over. It doesn't matter. They don't want to allow a correction to happen, but the fact of the matter is they don't control these markets at the end of the day. Can they manipulate them for a good while? Sure, they can. They have. They are. But someday, people run out of money in their pocket to keep this stuff going. I mean, unless they want to do that, unless they actually want to start printing money and put it into your pocket so you can go out and buy stuff. I mean, once you start running out of money, these companies lose out on revenue. They're not going to be able to increase their prices because you're running out of money. You can't afford it at today's prices. How the hell are you going to afford it at tomorrow's prices if they try to raise their prices because they're losing revenue? I mean, this is how this whole thing will start to cascade. The question is, what's going to be the catalyst that puts everything over the top, pushes it over the edge? We've gone through the list of 30 market risks for 2019 that was comprised by Deutsche Bank. We went through that. That was a very 
constructive exercise, I think, for this program. It started to explain to everyone out there what to look out for. And of course, there's always those things that you don't know you don't know. To quote Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld under George W. Bush. You don't know what you don't know. The unknown unknowns. So, it's anybody's guess what the catalyst is going to be. I think that list of 30 was very representative of some very high risks. Some, some obviously more likely to occur than others. Some of them we're already in the midst of. We're, we already have Italy in a recession. We know that by the skin of their teeth, Germany escaped a technical recession. But they're still trending down. They're still trending down. We still have the Brexit mess that continues to unravel day after day. It's another soap opera. It's a, it's a British soap opera. How's that going to end? How much further can they kick that can down the road? Because they're trying to. They're trying to. Prime Minister May was just, I mean, she couldn't make a deal. Is Parliament going to agree to a deal that she has? We know back in January they already said no, so now she's back to the drawing board. She's up against a whole bunch of bureaucrats in the EU that want nothing to do with a, a true Brexit. Again, the EU wants the Brexit to fail. They don't want it to happen. Because if the British people leave and they're successful, then the Italians are going to say, hey, we want out too. We're going to go. And the Greeks might follow. And the Spanish might follow. And the French might follow. And then it's done because there ain't no way in hell Germany and the German people are going to say, yeah, we're going to, we're going to continue to keep this whole thing propped up. We're going to continue to bail out everybody else. There's no way that that's going to happen. So it's going to be a, a, a political mess of which we may have never seen before. So again, and I've stated it many times before, if the European Union ceases to exist and or the euro currency ceases to exist in the near term, and that's, you know, five years or so, I would not be surprised and you shouldn't be surprised either because it is a failed and flawed system. It just is. It just is from day one. But people can kick the can down the road. They can hope for the best. And you can never underestimate that. That's why when you have people who, who have the ability to see past the horizon, see over, over the hill, they're very early to the game. Very early to the game. Sort of think, for example, if you've ever seen the movie The Big Short, which had to do with the uh, 08 09 financial crisis. You had a small group of, of investors and traders who sort of had this theory after looking at the numbers that, you know what, there's a lot of subprime people out there with a whole bunch of money that they owe on these mortgages. Their payments are going to balloon. They saw it. They saw this coming. But they got in, maybe some would say, early to the game. This really didn't start to unwind until late 2007 and then obviously through 08 and 09. But some of this was found pre-2007. And so they saw it and it's like, this is going to happen. I have to get involved in this market and I have to do the big short, right? I got to sell these, these crazy financial instruments. I got to sell them short. I got to sell them short. And that just means if the value of those assets go down, they make money. Okay. And they saw this catastrophe coming. It was as clear as day to them. Just like it's as clear as day to me that our economy and the global economy is in for a rude awakening. But to time it is incredibly, incredibly difficult, and it's really a fool's errand to try to time it. But it doesn't mean that you can't position yourself to make money off of it, or at least protect yourself. So my point is, just because you have the ability to see over the hill, past the curve, see what's on the other side, there still is that element of being right at the right time. So never underestimate, quite frankly, the stupidity of people and their ability to kick the can further down the road, to allow hope to be a strategy, and to prolong what is seen by many as clear as day to not happen as soon as what you might think it would, it would unfold. So, I would not have been surprised if, in the last quarter, we continued our, our sell-off. I really wouldn't have been surprised. 20% may have been a walk in the park. I would not have been surprised. 
but you had damage control right away. Right away. In 0809, you didn't have damage control and the catalyst had already been pushed and a whole bunch of things were in motion. But then you got it. Then you got the fiscal stimulus and the monetary stimulus kick into action. And it put a base, it put a floor under the markets and it sort of calmed things down. Well, I guess we learned from 10 years ago to be quick. Quick. As fast as you can snap your fingers, as fast as you can blink. React. And that's what the Federal Reserve did. They came out and said, no, it's not on autopilot. We're going to do a wait and see. We'll continue to see and monitor the data in regards to what we do with our balance sheet. It's not going to be on autopilot. It's not just going to be a monthly wind down. It's not. We, we didn't mean to say that. They came out. They cooled things down. Then you had President Trump send his secretary of the Treasury out with his plunge protection team, the biggest banks on Wall Street. Oh, yeah, everything's fine. We just dropped 20%. Everything's fine. Buy the dip. Didn't tell you to sell short or get out of the market, save 20% of your nest egg, of your portfolio. But he told you to buy the dip. That ain't right. I don't like it. I don't like it. And I'm going to get to some other things I don't like about what the president has been saying. And I brought that up yesterday, but I have to continue on with this because it is a very important point that people need to be aware of. Now, moving on with some of the other market news, we have oil, gold, and silver. They were a little changed, pretty much still where they were yesterday, a little bit of, little bit of moving up and down, but nothing, nothing to write home about. The 10-year Treasury yield, same place, 2.72%, so there wasn't much movement there. These markets, they don't know what's going on. They don't know what's going on. There's, you're the deer in the headlights look is what it is, because where's the news? Where's the catalyst? You know, you can only ride that POW put, the Federal Reserve printing money. You can only ride that Bank of Japan printing money and buying Nikkei ETFs, Swiss National, the Swiss National Bank buying equities, the Bank of England holding off, the ECB holding off. You can only ride that wave for so long. Markets get things priced in. And we've had a huge recovery since our 20% drop-off in the fourth quarter of 2018. We've had discussion after discussion, breadcrumb after breadcrumb of U.S.-China trade talks. Now the markets are fed up with it, and thank God, because I know I, for one, am sick of it, and nothing, is, and nothing great is going to come of it, and you have to understand, again, the math of it. 10% tariffs on $200 billion worth of goods, $20 billion, bucks. $20 billion on multi, multi-trillion dollar economies, in an even larger global economy, obviously. And that's, that, that's caused a huge rally. That, that's caused a huge temper tantrum. I don't think so. The whole thing with these trade talks has a lot more to do with structural issues of the Chinese and taking advantage of American companies for years. Getting our technology, spying on our companies, all that stuff. That, that's the real meat and potatoes of what's going on. And you have to applaud Trump for doing it, because none of our other presidents had the cojones to do anything about it. In fact, some of them may have been very well compl complicit in those transactions. Definitely look the other way, because they did not stand up for the ideals of American capitalism. They just said, well, you want to go to China? I guess you got to become a communist or, or you know, listen to what, what goes on over there, because there's 1.4 billion people, and, you know, you just got to do what they say. No, you can... When you're the world's, uh, you know, mega power, superpower, you have that type of uh, power, you use it. You use it. You say you want to grow, you're going to need us because we're the big guy on campus. They could have used it. Trump knows how to use leverage. Love him or hate him, the man knows how to make deals. You may not like some of his deals, but he is not afraid to negotiate. And he definitely knows how to use leverage, and he's finally using it. What happens at the end of the day, we don't know. We know that we're told that it's fantastic. It's remarkable. It's historic. But what's in it? We have no idea. Which gets me to another point. We had Larry Kudlow out on Fox News this evening. And, you know, he him and hawed a little bit. Of course, he continued with the line that it's great. It's, you know, we made a lot of progress, a lot more progress than he thought was going to be made. Well, evidently, because it was fantastic. But now, when I had said yesterday, because this was what was being reported, 
probably somewhere around March 27th, 28th, President Trump and President Xi were going to actually sit down and meet, have their signing ceremony, hash everything out, sign the best deal ever known to mankind. Well, now that's not so certain. It's not so certain. Larry Kudlow didn't want to give a date. He said, well, we're hoping for the end of March, early April. That's what we're hoping for. That's what we're hoping for. So again, kicking the can further down the road, hoping that something gets done now. And the markets are fed up with it. Buy the rumor, sell the news. That's what this is. Could there be another leg up? Because of the insanity in which we live, yes, it could. I cannot say for certain that these markets will look at this deal, even if it's a bad deal or nothing spectacular in it, as it's being sold to us as. And the markets could rally. They could make new highs. There's no questions about it because of the insane world we live in today and because there's a huge disconnect between stock markets and underlying economies. So most definitely it could rally higher. Most definitely. But don't be surprised also if it's buy the rumor, sell the fact. And when we finally get the facts, we get a sell-off, we get a, a, a correction, maybe we retest the lows. I don't know. I don't know. Just be prepared either way. That's what diversification is. And if you don't like the volatility and that much uncertainty, if you're close to retirement and you got a nice nest egg, then get out of the market. Get out of the market. I mean, talk to your financial advisor, do what you got to do. But, I mean, there's too much craziness at stake here, and there's too much going on from my perspective. I'm a risk-averse person. The, the, the goal of investing is to make money and to not lose money. When you have these type of people pulling these strings the way they are, it's very difficult to make heads and tails out of what's going to happen. There's no question, no matter how good of an investor you may or may not be, luck plays a big role. It does. It plays a big role. You can be very well read and researched and analytical, and that's going to obviously increase your quote-unquote luck. You're more prepared for opportunities as they present themselves, as they say, which is very true. But when you're in the stock market, I mean, you just don't know how the markets are going to react to a whole bunch of things. You can have an earnings report come out, and everything's good. They beat top line. They beat bottom line. They give good forward guidance, and the stock, and the stock market says, nah, we're, we're not very impressed with it, and it sells off. And then you have the complete opposite. You have the complete opposite sometimes. They underperform, but they didn't un underperform as poorly as the market was expecting, and so the stock rallies. That's what you're living in. It's very difficult to predict those types of movements, those types of moments. So if you're in this market and you're trying to trade it, be very careful. That's, that's all I have to say for you because I, I'm, I'm not in the market to trade it. I'm in the market to, to invest. That's, that's what it's here for. But when you're in this type of environment, it even makes that difficult because I just see more downside risk than I do upside risk. Now, we also have a dollar that continues to strengthen. So despite the fact we had a tweet from President Trump to buy the dip back in December and the markets rallied, then we had him at CPAC over the weekend saying he wants a weaker dollar. Well, the markets, I guess, haven't taken the hint yet and because the dollar continues to increase. Of course, a lot of that has to deal with the fact that most other economies around the world are slowing down as well, and these currencies are traded against each other. And so when their economic news comes out to the downside, typically means people are going to get out of that currency into something stronger or safer, and that's the U.S. dollar. So we have a dollar that is strengthening against, I guess, the wishes of President Trump, although I really don't understand why he wants a weaker dollar because that's going to hurt the lower and middle income class families. It's going to take more dollars to buy the same amount of goods. That's not good. That's not good. President Trump is supposed to be the president of the people. He was supposed to say, this government is now back in your hands where it belongs. Well, the vast majority of this country is middle class and lower class. So a weaker dollar ain't going to help those people out. So I don't know where he's going with that. Of course, it probably has to do with trade and trying to stimulate exports. But that's, we don't do enough exporting in this country. That's something structural. That's something that will take a long time. And we got bigger fish to fry. So I hope he does a reversal on that. 
I really do. Now, just some other news before signing off. I, I have been telling you guys, you know, you have to look everywhere. You can't just look in the United States. You have to pay attention to other markets around the world, what's going on in other economies. Well, we have Australia. Q4 GDP growth is below estimates. The Australian economy advanced a seasonally adjusted 0.2% in Q4 of 2018, slowing from a 0.3 expansion in the third quarter, missing market consensus of a 0.3 growth rate. It marked the weakest pace of expansion since a contraction in Q3 of 2016 as private consumption was subdued and non-dwelling non construction continued to fall. So we continue to see a slowing down in Australia, which, if you've been paying attention here, is no surprise. This was predictable. We're starting to see, obviously, a slowdown in much of Asia. The numbers out of Taiwan and South Korea have not been good. The numbers out of Japan have not been great. China is obviously slowing down. 6.6% GDP last year, and they just gave from the uh, People's National Congress, I said yesterday, they gave a target range for 2019 GDP of between 6% and 6.5%, which would translate into a three-decade low in economic growth. So it makes sense that Australia is also going to slow down because... They're a, big, they're a major exporter to that entire region, well endowed with natural resources, iron ore, gold, coal, natural gas, oil, a whole bunch of other things. So they're starting to slow down. Their housing market's overheated. The question is, will that government, will that central bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia, will they be able to contain those declines in the housing market and elsewhere? Now, if history is any guide, no, they will not be able to contain it. That's the whole problem. When you let this genie out of the bottle, when you open Pandora's box and you loosen your lending standards because you have, you're just awash in all of this money, you make poor decisions. You push yourself and others out further on the risk curve, and they make decisions that they otherwise would not have made because they say, well, I got all this money. I mean, what the hell? I might as well take a gamble. Well, as the gambler knows, he loses quite a bit, quite often. And that's what's going on right here. You can kick the can further down the road with some central bank printing, with some government fiscal stimulus, but that's all you're doing. You're just kicking it further down the road. I think we're finally starting to come to an end in that. Obviously, China and a lot of Asia bucked the trend in 0809, specifically China, and as a result, Australia and New Zealand were able to ride along with them on the commodity boom that China needed. I said yesterday, in the past three years, China used more concrete in the past three years than the United States did in the entire 20th century. Okay? That benefited a lot of other countries, especially export-driven economies, especially uh, those who are well endowed with natural resources. That's that's what you had to deal with. That that ride is coming to an end. So this, this should be no surprise. The question is, how big of a problem will this turn into? I hope it's not a big one, because this will be the same thing, 08, 09, here in the United States and elsewhere around the world. People will lose their homes. They will lose their jobs. You know, I, I get no joy or pleasure in saying these things. But again, I'm not here to lie to you. I'm not going to go on CNBC or Fox News or Bloomberg like all these other people do and just say everything's rosy, everything's fine. That's, that's not what I'm about. If I thought everything was rosy and fine, you'd hear it from me here. But I don't believe that, so I'm not going to say that to you just because it'll make you feel better. It's not what I'm here for. If you want to hear that, turn on CNBC or Fox Business. That's all they're about because they have advertisers. And they're not going to say... Don't buy those goods from the advertisers or those, their sales are going to go down because this economy is slowing down. It's not how it works. It's a business. They're in business. I'm in business, but my business is the truth. I'm more worried about the truth than I am commercials, but that's me. Now, despite the fact that we have that news out of Australia, which is, which is just more recent now, obviously, not uh, nothing that would have affected the U.S. markets uh, today, but we did have some news come out where we had the U.S. services, uh, you know, I talk about the uh, ISM and, and PMI numbers all the time. 
So here we have the ISM non-manufacturing PMI index for the United States, which has to deal with the services sector, jumped to 59.7 in February, up from 56.7 in January, and that beat market expectations of 57.3. Now, this is fascinating because this is good news. This is good news. That's a reading well above 50 on your contraction expansion. Well, this is really pointing to stronger expansion in the services sector. Well, we had good news. Why wasn't this a catalyst for the markets? Why didn't the markets move up as a result of that? Not good enough, I guess. And then we had the other. We had the IBD tip economic optimism index increased 5.4 points to 55.7 in March from 50.3 in the previous month and beating market expectations of 51.2. And it was the highest reading since November of last year. Again, good news. I'm not here to always be doom and gloom. I told you that if there's good news, there's good news. Well, that's positive news. Why is this not serving as a catalyst for these markets to rally? What's going on? Or has that already been priced in, as they say? I don't know. But I do know when we had bad news, the markets rallied. Now we have good news and they sell off or they stall. You see what I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen? These markets are disconnected from reality. Your guess is as good as the hedge fund manager managing billions of dollars. Nobody knows what's going on here. Nobody. Unless you're behind the scenes pulling the levers if that's taken place. Not a good position to be in when these markets are so disconnected from the underlying economies that they're supposed to represent. So we'll see what news breaks overnight. We'll see what news breaks tomorrow. I'll do my best to keep you guys posted. We'll see what happens with U.S.-China trade talks. Your guess is as good as mine, so let me know what you think. Thanks so much for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure having you. This is the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.